Hi guys, it's spring and this is my friend Yashi Brown <laughs> and uh, Yashi's here today to talk to us a little bit about poetry, a little bit about mental health um, and ASMR and the, uh, the intersection of those things. So um, I'm really glad to have you here. Um, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and um, I, I want to, um, I think what I'll have us do is actually talk to each other, um, but just do that on audio so we can really just, mm -hmm. all of you can just focus on what we're saying. Um, but I thought I wanted everybody to see your beautiful face first. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> to put a face with the voice. Yeah, yeah. so if you just mm -hmm. want to say hi. And... Well, it's really wonderful to be able to get a chance to express myself in a creative space using ASMR, which is very new to me. Yeah. But I like how it can add to the emotion of poetry. And poetry is full of... Um, you know, emotions and thoughts and ways of using that in a space where we can emo we can express ourselves that is different from everyday speech, but it can be felt in such a deeper way. And like, I think it was David, uh, Robert Frost who said, uh, poetry doesn't necessarily have to be understood to be felt. So with this technique, I see how that can be even more... Uh, it can make even more sense. So I love that, um, and that's really what I think it was Robert. Frost. Yeah, I think I think that was Frost, and I think that that really gets to a lot about um, the ASMR community mm -hmm. is that we're interested in words, but we're very interested in the music of words and mm -hmm. what they sound like and what the experience of just feeling them, like literally feeling them in our ears mm -hmm. and through our spine and through our body. So that's actually a perfect yeah, quote. For sure. So awesome. So we are going to, uh, yeah, I will just, we're going to have kind of a free form conversation and I'm just <laughs> so glad to be able to talk to you. So yeah, we'll get started. Fun. Okay. 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 So what we're going to do is just have a conversation, which I'm really excited about. And um, Yashi, real quick, do you want to tell them what you're munching on and why? <laughs> okay, so I'm munching on um, a small bag of Lay's potato chips. And then um, tell us the flavor. It's and it's important. the very, very original, basic, oily, salty Lay's potato chips. Okay. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. So um, the reason why is... Um, I come from music background, musical family, and when they would record their songs and do their albums, they uh, lays potato chips. Especially my mom, she would tell me how it makes the voice and it makes the tone stand out and nice and silky, and gives it this salty um, kind of a little bit more of a rasp. So. Um, and learning a lot about ASMR. And when I do my audiobooks, when I do anything with my voice, I love the way that it feels and I love the way that it sounds. So now you're getting to experience what I can never do when I'm doing an audiobook. When yeah. I'm doing an audiobook, I have to be quiet. So I got to eat as many lays and then get them out of the mic and make sure my mouth is clear of any like gristles. <laughs> and, um, because of ASMR, I'm able to do all of this stuff in your ear, and that is so freaky awesome. So <laughs> yes, it's, it's so cool. Uh, I love it. It's so cool. So excuse me if I overdo it. No, yeah, <laughs> enjoy the chips. So I'm doing something I would do anyways, but I get to do it here with you. It's so cool. And then the other, <laughs> other thing we're gonna do, <laughs> since we're just kind of having a conversation, um, I have some champagne. <laughs> <laughs> which um, I love and so we're gonna we're just gonna have a little bit I already uncorked it well actually Yashi did I'm very weak and she's very strong <laughs> so um so I'm gonna um but we are gonna go ahead and pour it so if you hear us sipping on champagne or um Yashi munching on the lays um that's just uh that's just because we're just kind of, we're hanging out and uh, 
we're excited to have you hanging out with us. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and pour. Um, and while I do that, um, Yashi, you mentioned um, audiobooks. So yeah. if you want to just talk a little bit about like what, what your background is, what are things people might know, what projects yeah. people might know you from. So I am a poet. I do spoken word as well as I've been writing poetry. I guess I got really serious about it when I was 15 years old. And then um, I started to go through a lot of emotional challenges when I was 19. And that by that point, my poetry took on a really um, emotion, seriously emotional, and I'd say in some ways a tragic turn because I was experiencing depression and the early signs of what would become severe bipolar disorder. Um, initially diagnosed with schizoaffective, and I say that because I like for individuals to know that it was intense. Um, bipolar can be from the, uh, I guess you could say it's a spectrum, kind of like autism and other illnesses, yeah, where um, you have the more milder forms, um, which are still very serious and can lend itself to some awful highs and lows. But then you have this more serious um, form of the disorder, or I like to say condition, because in a yeah. lot of ways, I feel the effects of the positivity of bipolar, which is um, something else we can talk about later. But um, I like for people to know how serious it was because so many individuals with my exact diagnosis, they live on disability, um, they are uh, have to live with their parents or a family member for the rest of their life. A lot of times the doctors tell them, you know, all the limitations and then the medication is much more heavy. So I felt like if I was able to get to a point where I had normal everyday functioning or as normal as we consider the word, just the ability to function every day, have a family and do all of those things, that I would have to talk about it because when I was having those issues and I was in my darkest moments, there was nobody with my symptoms uh, that were talking about these mental health challenges. And when I say symptoms, serious manias, uh, serious psychosis and um, delusions and um, just uh, being alienated and having a distorted reality from um, thoughts of that are unreal. So that's the part, uh, the features that can come from intense manias when you have bipolar type 1. So anyways, that can turn into a really long discussion by itself. But in the meantime, poetry was my way of being able to like myself. It was the only place in my brain where I liked myself. I liked what I was writing. I got a lot of um, incredible feedback from uh, people that were reading my work or that heard my work, and it gave me that confidence and helped build my self-esteem. Um, again, that's a huge component of these mental health challenges is seriously low self-esteem because of the stigma and because of how people are going to react towards you when they find out. So poetry was able to fill that space, and as a result, I just continued to get better and better and stick with it. So now I do my poems, I go out, I speak about mental health, and then I share spoken words so they can, you know, the audience and those dealing with these mental health challenges specifically as well can feel like they relate and can see, you know what, if you try hard, if you search hard enough, and I'm really big on spirituality and meditation um, and prayer, if you apply all of those, you can fight, find the right treatments, and hopefully I do believe, and I am under treatment, medical, so also medications, as just a basic foundation, but you definitely need that positive feedback, uh, positive affirmations, and a lifestyle that's healthy. These are all things that I had to learn over time, and then of course the poetry is huge for me, and that still is a huge therapeutic, cathartic, um, um, part of my everyday lifestyle. Um, another thing I wanted to, to mention is uh, I've talked about this before in some of my blogs and writing about um, Yoon's idea of the wounded healer mm. and it, his thought was that in order to to really uh, to really successfully heal to be a healer 
you know, you, um, you, you're wounded in some way. I guess it works two ways. One, that those of us who, who have these deep wounds, and of course we all have, we all have yeah. them. Um, but some of us who have especially maybe struggled um, seek out wanting to, to help others. And then it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing where we seek it out, but it also it heals us to heal yeah. others. And the fact that that is a more mutual relationship uh, yeah. makes it much more successful all around. So I don't know how much you sort of identify with that idea of maybe mm-hmm. being wounded in some way and that um, do you feel like that makes you able to uh, to sort of, I guess, to relate to people um, and to be able to bring more to um, what you can give? Absolutely. I mean, this is an amazing question. Um, I think this lies at the heart of the work that I do. Um, when I first started experiencing that deep bipolar depression when I was 19, and it went on for about three, four years before it started to manifest itself and start to take on this severe manic tone, during those moments, I didn't understand the way, the reason why I felt the way I felt. Um, crying every single day, locking myself in the room, being in a balled up in a corner, not telling anybody, mm-hmm. um, having these horrible thoughts of um, and about myself and writing these dark, dark pieces. I, I didn't know where all of these things were coming from. I was so attracted to the dark, to the dark in everybody. Mm-hmm. And then when things got really, really bad, and I wasn't able to find the medicines and I was in the hospital, I can't, I can't, I wish I, I don't want to bottle that emote that I wish I could like put it in a bottle mm-hmm. and th- that hopelessness that I felt so that at times when a person feels ungrateful or they feel a lack of compassion, they can open up the bottle and smell it, smell what that hopelessness feels like. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say that, and, and then close it, because I would never, I wouldn't wish that hopelessness on my worst enemy. I, I promise you, um, it is death in itself. And so when I finally was at that point, I'd look on the streets and I'd see the homeless person and I'd see the look in their eye and I'd see them and how they're dressed and I would just bawl crying for a long time. I so started to understand the hopelessness that exists on the streets, the hopelessness that exists in um, poverty and the struggle. Um, I started to just feel at a very heightened level humanity and sadness and how someone could easily, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, take their life. It's so easy. I thought about it over and over. I had gotten to the point of almost planning out my suicide, and there was something in me, I think it was also somewhat of a religious fear, (laughs) because I was raised very, very um, devoutly religious, and I, there was a part of me that had that, you know, that doctrinal fear but um that probably was just like the barrier but I just the empathy that came from that and that compassion and the ability to identify with sadness I wouldn't trade for anything if there's one thing I'm so happy I'm treated now and I found the right combinations of meds and positivity in my life I feel amazing but now that I'm finally through it I wouldn't trade that for anything because I didn't understand, and I am, I, and it's not about making excuses for people. It's just about seeing us in a way that it is really important. And um, so that wounded healer is a very w- great way of putting it. Although I feel like the ultimate healer is the universe. Um, however, we are the vehicles, we are the catalysts, and that identification that connecting is putting is the force for sure i do feel uh, that has a force in itself and then it activates kind of like this um movement that 
we are that activates growth in a tree or the growth in a baby or um, having you know uh, the fetus and all of that um, growing a baby inside of you that natural active force to me is what creates the change but us connecting and our ability usually some sort of whether it's scientific or whatever that connection is what creates all of those and puts all of those things and moving parts into motion so anyways um I love people, I really do. Um, people can be very hurtful, I know. I know a lot of us have experienced a lot of pain, but if, if once you understand how much we are, are all experiencing pain in a certain way, I just wanna be there and uh, any way that I can be of service, telling my story um, of just mental health, mental illness, and um, mental health across the board, I feel is so important. It was very scary for me at first, but um, it was a matter of being able to know that somebody's going to kill themselves, somebody's going to do something. If I can just be that little voice in their head to make them stop, whether it's one person or two person people, when I speak, let them know when as I'm talking that they're not alone, that I know what this is. I feel the struggle that's happening in the head. I feel the pounding and the bees and all those things that are driving your brain crazy that you can't control. Um, I feel that emotional hopelessness, that gaping hole that's the size of, um, gosh, that, that's an endless size, this huge hole. I feel those things. So if that person can listen, um, uh, then, then that's all, then I'll tell, I'll tell, I'll, I'll be an open book. I think that one thing I really like, and I, I've tried to, I try to, um, I try to write back to as many, um, wonderful yeah. letters and things. We I know we've both this. talked about this yeah. and it's, it can be really, di I mean, you know, it can be difficult. Um, but one thing that I, I try to instill is, is something that you're really hitting on in such an eloquent way is that when, you know, when people write to me and they tell me they feel sort of less than, or they feel deficient because they struggle with whatever it is, whether it's complex trauma, whether it's addiction, PTSD, whether it's a diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, they feel they feel less than. And um, to understand that there are gifts, significant gifts, that come from the, these experiences and that come from especially those of us who have um, the idea of the the tempestuous brain, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that there are gifts, and you're talking about those are gifts of compassion, gifts of expression, gifts of beauty, um, and gifts of connection. And I think one of those, um, and I see, I see these so much in the people in the ASMR community, um, especially the, the people who watch and listen because they're purposely going. Um, I, I really believe that people who do experience ASMR or who enjoy ASMR are people who enjoy that human connection. Mm -hmm. They enjoy that vulnerability, and that takes a lot of strength. Yeah. So I just have a lot of respect for those people, and I think that those struggles are what enable us to feel so close to one another. But I think, like I said, one of those gifts is gifts of expression, and that goes to you and your poetry. And so I kind of wanted to know a little bit about your, your mm -hmm. journey um, or about the function of poetry. Um, the imagination, um, reaching that word, it's about poetry to me is that word, that sentence that will express the picture in your head of what it is that the, 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 uh, subject matter or what it is you're trying to say. So capturing that in a couple, the words that's going to capture it, the best word, the best way of describing this thing. That's the fun part. Like, that's what I love so much about poetry. Um, you know, you'll have an emotion, you'll have a topic and then you're like, try what, how would I describe this one thing? And then that knowing of 
just opening your brain. I just feel like just imagine um, a zipper on your head and mm. you're undoing the zipper mm -hmm. and then you pull it up. Like I literally picture that and then you're opening your head to whatever is going to go inside of it. And um, the just it start it just the different it just starts to come the just different juxtapositions and the mm -hmm. different um, analogies of how you would describe something. So it's about really opening up yourself without any limitations, not judging one thing that comes in. You know, um, I can be. Yeah, uh, I like to use the, I love my favorite chair with its warm smile. Like, it doesn't really make sense, but it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. My favorite chair with its warm smile, you know, you, the war, you know, it's warm, it is kind of worn and it's, it, it doesn't, that is the poetry of life. Like being able to, um, you know, uh, being able to just to give personality and all these different uh, actions to things that are totally inan inanimate, giving a towel a total personality and like mm -hmm. making this towel a diva and how this <laughs> towel just likes to stay clean because when it's clean, it can just, you know, uh, do everything, you know, and as soon as a body, it doesn't like getting dirty. It's like, ugh, well, what kind of person are you? Then you can use me, you know? Like, I'm you? thinking of a Turby twist. Yeah, you know, it's twist. like, you know, I am Egyptian cotton. I mean, uh -huh. where have you been? <laughs> you know, only certain bodies can touch me. Yeah. And then you have the totally that. humble towel that's been worn a little, and it's like, I'll wrap you with love. So anyways, yeah. just, just, just doing uh, just fun stuff like that. You have that freedom in poetry and prose, you know, and other types of writing. Um, you have to think about structure more and definitely there is a structure to the literature of the past and even present of poetry um, that should always to me always be respected I respect it yeah, I um, if you truly love poetry I think there's a part of us that really respects all the different expressions and manifestations of it right. uh, but at the end of the day um, when free verse and, uh, came out, and I still love the blank verse. I am a big pentameter type stuff too. Uh, the vil oh, the villain. Yes, yeah. all of those different things. <laughs> Sonic um, crown. <laughs> um, yeah, the um, the Sistina oh, that'll yeah. drive I you love, nuts. I love that. I, I love, love the Sistina. Yeah, I'm a sucker or Sestina. Yeah, Sestina. I'm saying we it like you know <laughs> most people say it's Sistina. Right? It's Sestina. Isn't it's it that Sestina. nice? Villanelle. These are nice <laughs> words. Okay. I love Villanelle. Villanelle is pretty, right? Ses yeah. Sestina. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. No, I'm a sucker for form. But yeah. but yeah, what you're I mean. I think the idea that you're very free in your narrative and you're talking yeah. about per personification and yeah. also something that um, is often uh, referred to specifically in literature transferred epithet, the idea of describing something in a way that uh, that really, really m makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. It's really disorienting. Um, but I think that's, again, where that idea of of the mind that has maybe, well, it, the way you said it, you know, been unzippered, I suppose, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, a mind that maybe doesn't always put things together the way they're meant to be put together mm -hmm. starts to have this perspective where, like, you see a towel and you mm -hmm. see an entire, <laughs> you see an entire story, you see an entire mm -hmm. life in that. I think yeah, that that's, that's a great way of putting yeah. it. It's, yeah, you just see all of these different existences and dimensions and things that we don't care about which is such a but <laughs> it's it such a makes call, life so interesting it's a callback to what you were saying about mm -hmm. having maybe an enhanced consciousness looking at people from different walks of life than you you know when you were talking about um if you see you know someone on the street and being uh -huh. able to really inhabit that mind space in a way that's natural is i think the very same kind of brain that would yeah. be able to see a towel and to see the you know this entire story <laughs> this entire life there this world so yeah I think that that's and lovely getting to what you were just talking about um, when I was 12 years old uh, I, my uncle I came home from school 
and there were all these presents in the living room and I was yeah I was given the newest uh, CD disc uh, player at the time and all these CDs and awesome speakers it was my first sound system I was 12 years old like on a major level yeah. sound system and all the major CDs that were out at the time were part of the um, you know the gift and so at the time um, Sting had this uh, well-known hit on the radio it was a fast song that I was familiar with and I thought it was cool and then everything else on the album was just like these slow contemplative songs well the name of the album is uh, written after one of Shakespeare's son sonnets uh, nothing like the sun mm -hmm. he, in that particular album was some of the most amazing words to me in the song fragile and I was 12 years old um, just the words and the music uh, musicianship behind it um, just touched my heart and it touched my heart to the point where I wanted to know more about the other songs. So I started reading the lyrics and then I just fell in love with words. I just fell in love with the power of words being put together to create those sensations that I was having at such a young age. And then um, I just started noticing words more so than um, the music behind the words. I, I still love a funky beat. I still love that, like, um, what is it called? Uh, my mom likes to say this uh, pulsating, throbbing beat, you know, I'm like, what are you going through all that for? <laughs> but that pulsating beat, like, I still love all of that stuff, but I do want to know what somebody is saying, too, and that's when it became really important, and that just grew and grew and grew into, you know, me eventually writing and realizing um, the different areas of communication that I was very inclined to, and that came very easy. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, growing up in a very musical family, mm -hmm. you know, it seems that music um, has been, it, it seems like it's part of you, inextricably. You feel you feel this on a deep level, um, and then you shift, I mean, not necessarily shift, but you also have this deep appreciation for poetry and for, it seems like, for the spoken word in general. Yeah. You've told me a lot about yeah. how right now you're really loving audiobooks and that oh, format. Yeah. So I want to know a little bit yeah. about what you think makes a great audiobook, what that experience, how that experience is different. We were talking a little bit earlier that I sort of like in a narrator in um, in an audiobook to the way I see typography, that mm -hmm. really great typography should serve the words that are written but not distract from them and I think maybe you feel the same about yeah. what makes a great narrator what makes a great voice so I want to I want to know what you have to it's say about that it's such an interesting thing because yeah. um I got into audiobooks back in October 2015 I like that you can date it You're like October <laughs> 2015. October 2015 Yashi Brown gets into audiobooks yeah it was so monumental there it. were so many books that I wanted to start reading I just mm -hmm. didn't have the time and I was becoming yeah. really really like gosh I want to get to this book and, and then you I, travel like crazy let's yeah, be I very clear in, I live in LA so an yeah. hour and 20 minutes of traffic yes. is extremely you mild live in, I call it I call it free planet yeah, yeah so and also just running errands around town and cleaning up my room and organizing my closet mm -hmm. I was just starting to realize um, you know I just didn't have time anyways I love Amazon I'm obsessed with Amazon okay and then um, I get the prime subscription and then they give me this thing to have a one month trial of oh, audible they got you with that yeah yeah and i started looking on audible at the different books and i'm like wow do they have this one book that i've been interested in and i said well let me try this out this might be a really good balance and me being able this might be a really good fix for this sure. so i started to david r hawkins uh, letting go the power of surrender that was actually one of the first ones um also uh, soulmates and different types of books that I start I start out with pretty simple books anyways I realized that musical just raised in a musical environment the power of how I've always loved sound I've always loved the sonics of uh, behind a really good record a lot of the reason why we do like some of these songs from the past is because the engineering was brilliant on those oh, songs absolutely. and they go and the engineering went beyond whatever the sound of that time period hugely. was hugely so it just took me back 
into how powerful music is and I was able to just within seconds have access to this world through my ears which I truly feel is the most powerful way to take in anything because it's going directly into your conscious and subconscious in such a powerful way I think it's having even more of a effect in your mind uh, I've gotten so much fulfillment out of listening it's so enjoyable it's so multitasky and um, yes that's sad it's sad it's fine to feel it's so satisfying my shoes I'm yeah. still do, I'm able to do so much now now yeah. I'm able to organize my shoes and learn some more awesome quotes <laughs> and then also what I've noticed along the way is the voice mm -hmm. of the narrator is huge it can turn an amazing book into something um, not so amazing mm -hmm. um, what I've learned on audible is the uh, the recommendations and the ratings are pretty on point, meaning they also include the narrator, not just the information behind the book. So people are having these yeah. conversations. So people are yeah. having these conversations and they're talking about, okay, the narrator. I am reading this one spiritual manuscript right now and the narrator, it's a male voice. I have gone to sleep so peacefully listening mm -hmm. and then I have to rewind because I realized I didn't hear what he was saying in the end. Yeah, but okay. I've gone to sleep so peacefully because he He's got this very, um, I'd say it's not authoritative, but it's somebody who, it's a trustworthy voice that's very neutral mm -hmm. in emotion. So he's very neutral in emotion and it's a very trusting voice, but it's not trying to entice it's not trying to sway it's just being very neutral and authentic and is that what creates that that feeling of trust do you think the lack I think, of affectation i think the lack. thank you thank you for that word i think it is creating that because the information is so jarring so confrontational uh -huh. this is a manuscript that's really in your face and um can make you you'll be like what they didn't just say what I think they said. Right. So if he said in a different type of tone or voice, but the fact that it was so neutral, the fact that, but at the same time, very specific. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are moments of emphasizing certain words and all of that. To me, it just makes, um, it has such a powerful effect. Then there was another book that I was reading and it was a very central book about the empowerment for women mm -hmm. and going after, you know, what it is that you are passionate about in life. Yeah. And the voice was a little too sexy. And the material was, I'd say the material is a sensuous subject, um, not an overtly sexual because that's not what it was There's trying to do. There's a big difference. I, yeah. yeah, it wasn't overtly yeah. sexual. You can but be it was sensual. There, but, but, it was, but it was very, uh, the information is very sensual in itself and how we're supposed to relate to our bodies mm -hmm. to me the narration was a little was a was a real little bit overtly sensual mm -hmm. and maybe it was more noticeable because of the words so for me it was a little distracting but I still loved it I still love the de delivery but it little but it did have on a sexual more of a kind of that effect and that was an interesting thing because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought, you know, you would have thought you want to take on a voice that um, really does mirror uh, what the subject matter is. But that would have been a time for probably a much more neutral type of voice, still nice tone, mm -hmm. but a much more neutral voice so that the power of the seriousness of the topic would not be diluted. Yeah, I think that that makes perfect sense and that there are some words that are are powerful in and of themselves and maybe don't need to feel it almost sounds like an overselling of the content that that's a good way yeah, yeah which is, yeah. Is, is interesting and I think um I think you're perceptive to those things because you do you do hear the music in words mm -hmm. and that makes me wonder if that's sort of what um I know that the as as it is to many many people because we only recently have terminology for yeah. it um but is the, is this some of what 
what led you to discover or become interested in the idea of ASMR? Absolutely. Yeah. So that was back in October, and then ever since then, I've read several books. Mm-hmm. Um, I still say the word read. I don't know why, but I've listened to several books since I love then. It. Yeah, it's, and it's a kind it's, of yeah. yeah, and uh, it's because we're used to saying read, yeah. and. Um, It's just become more and more enjoyable. It's become so wonderful to be able to take in so much information. And I'm working on my audio book right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting, uh, which you do use inflection. You do use a little bit performance with the audio book, for sure. Um, And then I'm going to be adding some musical elements and um, some other cool elements throughout the audio book. Hopefully people will really enjoy. And um, the gentleman who is helping me with my uh, website um, really was taking taking to the poetry on my side and said have you ever heard of ASMR I said no I haven't he says well it's something I think you should look into Um, it's an amazing community of individuals he saw what I did with mental health that that is the predominant uh, force and inspiration behind my creativity and behind my poetry Absolutely. and he saw how much of an advocate I mean I literally I do quite a bit of traveling I go uh, and I speak publicly I do book signings and these are audiences um, with uh, organizations like the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Mental Health America. I'm also on a board for peer support. And then I work with the Painted Brain, which is a um, amazing community of individuals expressing themselves through art that have a a diagnosis and pretty severe diagnoses as well. And just to interrupt you for one second, the the Painted Brain is also something I've talked about Uh on this channel before. So we'll make sure to include a couple links for anyone who's interested in Mm -hmm. supporting what they're doing, um, just to make sure we do that. But go on. Yeah, so um, the web the webmaster did the uh, Pain of Brain website and mm-hmm. works with them uh, often, saw the work that I do with mental health, talked to me a lot about the ASMR community and how amazing that it is and how a lot of it is um, really, really helpful for individuals that have mental health challenges and that deal with certain conditions and that I would be a pretty good fit with the spoken word that I do, but also being able to just have another form of of uh, being of service to individuals out there in a very cool and unique way. So I did some research on it. And in the meantime, he connected me here with Nicole. And um, it just evolved into such a wonderful thing because we hit it off really well. Oh, the yeah. personalities yeah. just gelled. And she's like, let me. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. she's super cool. Yeah. Let's make that. <laughs> I've had a little champagne. Let's make that clear. Yeah, she's phenomenal <laughs> and super attractive <laughs> oh thank you um and so i i just uh it just all came together so fast like yeah. within three weeks we were like let's do this and then yeah. i was like it's a good definitely mesh. it's a good meshing and um i really liked Nicole's um, audience and how passionate and, and serious and um, how focused it is on positivity yeah. and the message behind you know the health the keeping healthy the healthy mind aspect yeah. and then how transparent everybody really is I felt like that is a great use of this art and technique yeah. and yeah. Um, the ability to utilize and kill like I said I hate the I kind of hate the expression, but it's such a good one to kill five birds with one stone, you know, to be able yeah, to... Yeah, she does not hate birds. Um, <laughs> she's been very nice to my cat. She is not an animal <laughs> hater. This is a figure of speech. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Is that a bad one? No, it's not, I'm totally teasing. But it's, some, it's such a no, good... It's no, like, no, it's But true. the ability to hit certain... Hit all the areas that I do... There's an intersection um, that's it, really natural. That's really naturally creative, yep. the positive, the mental health in the poetry, but then the direct experience of having that impact physically as you're doing something because of the technique you're using, because of Mr. Mars Bionoro and the 3D, it, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. It was an absolute no-brainer. And that's, like, we're sitting right now with our, with yeah. our lays and our champagne, mm-hmm. and we're actually sitting on the floor of my bathroom, which <laughs> I'm so sorry, um, but it's the quietest room in my place. Um, and... There was the chip. <laughs> and, um, and, and 
we're sitting with the, the microphone between us, um, hoping that you are listening to us talk and sort of feel like you're sitting right here with us, which is a big part of ASMR. And I think that um, the ASMR community, and I especially the um, my viewers, whom I, I just adore, um, super, super inspiring people in that they completely just like like you uh they they don't shy away from just owning what they've been through what they're dealing with mm-hmm. and i think that they, that this takes crazy crazy amounts of bravery yeah. and um and so i think knowing how brave the the people who um who listen to my channel and who interact in our community are um you're just such an an obvious fit for it yeah yeah it was it was weird it it's was weird awesome thing. asmr is weird it's weird <laughs> it's super weird. i was just a magnet of moth to a flame yeah oh, totally yeah i was like this is so Hope, weird hopefully a nice Yay. warming i'm excited warm, warming again. flame oh wow it's, but it's, it's, it's super strange and i think um i think what what is so fun is it's so new and i know that when you we had a conversation a couple you know asking well i've been told that maybe an asmr video should be this long or maybe this should be the content of what an asmr video is and i was pretty quick to say like no 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 no. i don't i think what we have is we have this this wonderful you know set of ideas and this wonderful Mm -hmm community of people and this wonderful affinity um, and assuming that we know really anything I, I, I'm, I'm rather agnostic in most of my thinking mm-hmm. I don't assume to know or master a whole lot and mm-hmm. um, so I'm more excited for you to uh, to play with the medium and to yeah. again you know I've talked about the intersection of this idea of being an advocate, of being a, a poet and a creator, mm-hmm. and then literally being a voice. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited. What are your plans um, for, uh, for I guess, exploring the community and the kinds of projects that you might want to bring to us? Like, Absolutely. what can we look forward to? So, uh, definitely plan to uh combine uh more kind of positive affirmations and uh gearing a lot of my work um into uh, a lot of sci-fi so have some dreams yes, i'm excited for this. some more dreamy spacey types of poetry mm-hmm. um things that'll lift you up and maybe put you into orbit that trans- <laughs> that that transportation we talked about transportation, that imaginative that, transportation that, um and then also being able to do a few pieces, which I've already have, um, we'll demo some poetry here soon, that are very authentic in our feelings, in a struggle. So it'll be like something that we're dealing with that is this feeling, and hopefully a lot of you will connect to, yeah, I've had that feeling, that uncomfortable feeling or whatever, and expressing that authenticity and then how to be victorious, how to come out of that as a champion, as a winner. In addition to that, um, I also want to just, I like the visuals part of it. Uh, So it's a way for people to get to know me in a very natural setting. Um, And honestly, there's a lot of selfish to this. (laughs) It's so fun for me. This is so new. This is bringing so much new life to just being able to just writing a poem and doing a spoken word performance on YouTube. This is interesting. This is, this is actually um, makes me excited about doing a lot of videos. So I guess, I don't know if that was too long no it's great that's just the beginning and um what i maybe i hope you sort of start to experience is what um what i experience which is you know we're talking to this very weird looking microphone right now most of you in the community have you guys yeah we can actually touch and maybe you guys listening can I can like whisper in your ears. These are like the softest rubbery ears. Yeah, they're these little silicone <laughs> ears. So a lot of you have probably seen what some wow. of the um, the binaural ASMR type of microphones look like. But what I feel is, yeah, it's this like strange disembodied head uh-huh. almost. Um, but 
what I I experience is like I feel like there's there's you and me and there's some champagne and some lays um <laughs> and sitting on my bathroom floor but I feel like there's someone else like a good friend here with us yeah. who you can have this real close conversation with where yeah. we can really feel each other and I think that um the 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 very my favorite content creators in the community are people who I listen to and I just feel like like hey we're hanging out yeah. you know whether whether it's a more formal role play or it's informal kind of like just us chatting today um it's it's interesting because media um, and this is actually something again that might go back to um to to your upbringing is the idea of media and um, entertainment, but communication, all of that being pretty removed from people. Like there's glitz and there's glamour and there's Hollywood, and you know we can we can watch movies and we can listen to music and it, it can really really move us and that's wonderful. But we're living in this great day and age where more and more, especially young, young people, and I'm talking about really young people, kids, they spend more time on YouTube than they do, Mm -hmm. um, you know, watching television. Totally. And so it's this lovely time when we can, we can sort of all become closer together. There's less of this divide of, you know, you're the one talking. It always feels to me when I do any video or just audio like we are today, it feels so much more like a casual conversation. And the fact that you can like sit here with me and eat your potato chips (laughs) and just hang is, I mean, I think that your, your spirit is so rife and, and perfect for this. And I'm so excited. I, I feel like I'm literally talking to an expert. Like I love how you have cultivated, um, such a supportive, uh, tribe if you could say oh it's all done i've done yeah (laughs) yeah no but i know but um that's still part of bringing people into one area yeah you know and um i just saw the work that you were doing i said i want to learn and if there's somebody to learn from i felt you were the person and so it was a natural thing for me to come out here and spend some time and learn about this i also want to learn about um and I've read so much on the physical aspects of binaural. Yeah. Can you tell me on yeah. the interview a little bit more about the science behind it from just your aspect? Again, sure. I've done research, yeah. but from your personal as, uh, experience. Yeah, and the, this is such a fascinating thing because a lot of the science is new, so consensus and peer review are still happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I tend to... Um, I absorb it, but I tend to go back in some ways to sort of my own impre- impressions of the science and mm-hmm. how, it, how it works, which could be incorrect one day. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my impressions of the science and my, I guess my real feelings are that, um, first of all, I do believe in this is something that we're coming close to consensus on. It's, it's difficult. Um, not everybody experiences ASMR. There are people who do say that they've learned to mm-hmm. over time, that they become attuned to it. And, yeah. um, and I'm not I'm not sure. For a lot of us, it's something that we, we've experienced forever and felt mm-hmm. like, this is so strange. This thing is happening to me again. Yeah. I can't really tell anyone. This feels great, but it's super weird. It's super weird. Super weird. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so uh, so I I find it, it always interesting to try to talk to people who don't experience it. Um, again, I liken it maybe to, this is so unfortunate, but like migraines. Some people get migraines. Some mm-hmm. people just don't get migraines. Um, yeah. And they never will. Yeah. So it's very difficult to explain a migraine. Or like I get night terrors. It's very hard to explain what a night terror is um, compared to a nightmare to someone who's never had them. Yeah, that's These are very negative never... examples, yeah. but um, but it's very difficult to explain ASMR uh, to the entire world. And so because of that, there's a lot of questioning. Um, but what I believe and what the science suggests is that uh, there are people who have I don't know if it's correct to say biological empathy that maybe is stronger, but say we find that if you were to yawn right now, um, 
I would have a higher chance of yawning in response to that depending on certain levels of empathy that exist within me, which is interesting. Yeah. And I really believe that um, the ASMR response is one that does stem from some sort of empathy, the idea that uh-huh. there's this uh, there's this physical reward for closely listening and opening yourself to someone. Now, the neuroscience on that is complicated, and mm. I don't totally want to um, delve into it, nor am I able to in a completely cohesive way. But yeah. um, but I think that that the answer is just that this seems like this seems like a social evolutionary tactic which is wonderful we're very very socially advanced animals but we're still animals we talked about this a little bit too and that's why sometimes we see we see the bad sides of this as in Mm -hmm. on the internet sometimes people enact things that are maybe kind of base animalistic and um and maybe not so pleasant for everybody but i think the other the other end of that is that Human beings understand that there is um, there is a lot to be gained from society, mm-hmm. and our our brain, it would seem, is rewarding us from really listening up. Mm-hmm. But I think the other part of it is we were also talking about um, because Yashi was sharing with me her her really awesome trade secret about the lays, um, <laughs> you know, being able to really sort of like coat coat your your mouth or your it throat. It just gives Give it, it a this nice, nice like oily. I don't know. You feel this this huh? like polish. Yeah, it's just you feel this this depth. this this. Uh, this easiness that overcomes the vocal cords, and good. then you feel uh, just uh, just in your tone quality, you, you just feel it. I don't know how. Yeah. Really, but it's the salt and the oil. And mm-hmm. so I think I think it also helps you hit your notes. So if you're actually ah. singing a song and you're going into a note, it will help you hit. So those maybe notes. like a little bit of lubrication. There, dang, yeah. Why was I not? That was no. the word I was. No, no. It lubricates in a certain yeah. kind of a way, for sure. So yeah. so we were talking about that, and um, I've had uh, some training in, in theater, and Yashi certainly has. Um, she has excellent diction and elocution in real life. Really, really lovely. <laughs> and um, but I was telling her basically anything that you know about voiceover. Um, the great thing about ASMR is you can kind of throw that all out the window yeah. because. And I think this also comes down to. Um, I like. I love that. To something very, very scientific, which is the fact that um, ASMR. So I can talk really, really close into your ear, <laughs> and. You can maybe, if I'm talking very close into your ear, or like blowing into your ear, you can almost feel me, and there Yashi is like blowing into the other ear, which is perfect. So you can almost feel us right there with you, um, especially if you're wearing headphones right now. Mm -hmm. And the more that, if I were doing classic voiceover, I wouldn't want my mouth to make mouth sounds. So I, I knew, notoriously don't love the term mouth sounds, but I do like mouth sounds because it feels more like somebody right next to you talking to you. Um, it feels like some of the very, very first responses we have to voice, which is maybe a parent or someone we love taking good, close care of us. Maybe the first time you truly, really fall in love and that person talks to you closely or maybe a good friend is comforting you. We perceive the sounds of the mouth, the feeling of the breath. These things activate something in us. And you talked before about trustworthiness and what makes a voice trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And... A voice that's right here next to you that just sounds real that doesn't sound overly rehearsed that might stutter or stumble that might say things in a way that in, is in sort of an accent or with an inflection you're not used to it feels more authentic it feels less affected and it's so close to you and so I think that um, you know we're finding out more and more about the exact science of the kinds of, of chemical responses we have and what's released from that but that'll be interesting it'll be interesting and it's it's fun to be 
on the cusp of that journey right now. So that's why I'm excited for you to um, to be able to experiment because that's all any of us are doing is, yeah. you know, experimenting, not getting too inhibited by exactly what we find out because just uh-huh. because one thing is comforting to, to one person uh-huh. something totally different might be comforting to someone else and, right. and we get to explore that so. that's true and I like the idea of lisp yes yeah I can imagine what a lisp is. I can't even do lisp right very well. yeah it um yeah the what if or those who don't really pronounce their R very well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> For me, I love um, I love accents. I love listening to people speak in English, but where English might not be their first language. I really mm-hmm. love this. The unexpected element of it can be very grabbing and yeah. that kind of thing. So, um, well, what I, I would love is, this has been such a great conversation, at least on my, I've just enjoyed enjoyed it so much um it's been lots of fun yeah so what i think we'll do is if you don't mind um i might have you just read uh whatever you're comfortable with like a give us a small sample of maybe some of the poetry sure and uh and then i will um post links to your channel and to where people can find more from yashi yeah uh, if that sounds good and is there anything else that i didn't ask her that you would love to say to people um i don't know if i talked about my book oh okay. yeah yeah so I, it's gonna be coming out pretty soon yeah. it's called black daisy in a white limousine so all the poetry we're talking about and that i'm going to be reading to you it's from that compilation nice. that's it that's lovely. black daisy in a white limousine so anyways so we'll have we'll finish with just a little poetry mm-hmm. and um thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and we'll be back with just a tiny bit of a little taste of yashi for you so um going to begin with a piece called 211 and this is something that I recently wrote it's 211 I'm at a loss for thoughts not because of the hour but why oh divine you have taken the wind out of my lungs and blown my mind into the most exquisite stardust I stare in awe at its new formation, a mystic revelation, a new birth, how I must cease to exist in order to delight in this new sanctuary called 211. And here's another one. I think you'll enjoy. I'm just going to have a little bit of my chamomile tea. The scene was vulgar and bizarre. One could see from afar. Taste of nicotine and Jameson, hard knocks and amaretto, rolled into a blunt and dipped in six inch stilettos. No, he was not my kind of fun. No, it was not my typical circus act at all. No, this wine wasn't fine. His pedigree most surely couldn't be mine. He was an interesting hell, a new kind of drum, a dance destined or doomed. You see, I always loved a smooth arrow, but he was a wild shotgun. Boom. I was overwhelmed. I was appalled. But I kept coming back for more and more and more of what I simply didn't have the gall. His novel was the smut 
of many pages, the star-spangled banner of endless dark ages. How in the world did he manage to snag this square maiden? He wasn't my kind of people. He ran with hustlers, wheelers, and dealers, but the universe said no. He is an equal and crashed us together beyond opposites attract. I matched his wholesome and he matched my obscene for it was written and my impending fate. No, no, he was not my pedigree and he never will be. is his soulmate. I think leave that's all for now. So thank you so much and I appreciate the experience.